How many appreciate God's Word? Amen. Amen. So wonderful to have that He's given us His Word that we can look at each and every day and know that He's speaking to us through His Word. And uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, people are like, God, give me a word, give me a word. He's like, I gave you 66 books. That's <laughs> my word, amen. I mean, it's not to say that God will not give us personal revelation, but uh, He's speaking to us every time we look at His word, amen. And this morning, I want to talk to you about something. Uh, you know, there's what's called milk in the Word of God, and then there's what's called meat. And today I want to talk to you about what I consider meat, because we're going to talk about forgiveness. And uh, sometimes that's a difficult subject, amen? And uh, so we just uh, pray for the grace of God to guide me in what I say and how I say it, and to open your hearts to receive, and just ask for the anointing of His Holy Spirit to make it real to us this morning, amen? You know, I... Uh, I study all week, you know, beginning Monday. I study to, to share the word I believe God has for Crossroads Fellowship. And uh, so I just pray that I heard him right. I believe I did. And uh, I just pray that your hearts would be open and that you would receive victory today if you're struggling in the area of unforgiveness. One thing for sure, if you're breathing and you have any kind of a relationship with anybody, there's two things that are for certain. You're going to have to forgive and you're going to need forgiveness. Amen? In Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read to you verse 13. And it reads there, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also, listen, must, everybody say must. Must. Must do. There are times in our relationships that you bear one another. Now what does that word bear? Another way of putting it is, there are times you just got to put up with some people. There's times you just have to put up with your spouse. Amen? Don't say that too loudly. <laughs> but if we're honest, there's some times in most relationships, that I know of anyway, that you just simply got to put up with them. Amen. I'll say she's probably now. <laughs> no, she is here. She's right next to me. Yeah. Or you can get a break or, or lose <laughs> sense or something. Man. But there are times, you know, in a marriage that you just put up with one another. There are times in the church somebody can just simply get on your nerves. Sometimes you got to just put up with your pastor. Amen? Some, oh, good. Thank you for not that. <laughs> but there, there are times that we just simply have to put up with one another because we're, uh, we're made up of different personalities. And sometimes... Certain personalities don't rub quite right with each other. And we're, you know, in a smaller church, it's not as difficult. Or sometimes it can be more difficult because it's more intimate. But nonetheless, in a larger church, it's just that many more personalities that you got to, to have a relationship with. So there's times that we just have to put up with one another and forgive one another. And God's grace will mend that. Amen? Work relationships. You know, that's where you spend most of your time. There's times you just got to put up with that other co-worker. Amen? And uh, you got to bear them. And if we're quick to forgive, it can save us all a lot of trouble. Amen? Alright. Now, let me just say this. I am a pretty forgiving person. It's just part of my personality. And my daughter is a very forgiving person. I think it's just kind of in our DNA. I think we got it from my mother because she was an extremely forgiving person. I, I can forgive and forget pretty quick. 
And, and I call I count that a blessing because there's a lot of people that really have to work at it really hard because it's just not really in their makeup to just forgive like that. They they have a tendency to want to hold on to it and want to get even. But God says we're not to do that, amen. So we got in cooperation with God and His Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We have to sometimes work on it to, to uh, be obedient to what He tells us to do in His Word. You know, there are some things that we do to one another, again, that are just annoying. And we need to learn to forgive and to forget. Have you ever heard of a do-over? I know when we were kids, and well, you know, let's just say like uh, you're playing basketball, you're playing horses. Does everybody know what horse means? What, what game that is, you know, you shoot and then uh, you make it, and then the person behind you shoots and they miss. You got an H, you got an O, you know, RSE, and so forth. Well, you know, how about I'm playing, and, and uh, yeah, I'm playing Tony. We played that game a lot of times on the basketball court. And, you know, say Tony shoots up, he makes it, and I come up behind him, I shoot and I miss, I go, do over. <laughs> and Tony's going to be like, all right, Dad, H. Because <laughs> he's not as forgiving as I am. <laughs> So, you know, or let's say, you know, you're, you're driving along and you're doing 55 in a 40 mile an hour speed zone and, and the police pull you over and the police comes up to you and he said, you know how fast you're going? Yes, sir, I, I was doing 55. You know it's a 40 mile uh, speed uh, limit through here? Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to write you a ticket. Yes, sir, that's fine. He writes the ticket out to you and he hands it to you. You say, thank you very much for this ticket, officer, but you know what? I think I'll just take a do-over. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. Amen? Well, the good news is this. In life, we make mistakes. We say things that we shouldn't say. And we do things that we shouldn't do. And many times, we would like a do-over. Amen? Well, the good news is God has given us do-overs. And it's called forgiveness. God forgives us. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it reads there, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We get to start over guilt-free and fresh because He forgives us and He cleanses us. When we confess our sins, He washes our sins away. Amen? Now, before we go further, I want to take just a moment to touch on a couple things because I think this is very important today. There are a few schools of thought on forgiveness. And I want to talk to you about those. Some believe confession of sin is necessary to stay saved. I remember... The first church that I pastored, there was a, a, a family in our church that had a nephew that went on a mission trip and they asked me, they said, Pastor, could my nephew come and share a testimony about his mission trip? So, you know, I said, yeah, sure, uh, that'd be fine. And so we set up a time and he came in. Well, rather than sharing a testimony about his mission trip, he began to preach. I tell you, you know, sometimes you, you know, people think, you know, of course, I, I, you, I'm usually behind the pulpit here, and I like being behind the pulpit. I, I love to preach. I love to share the word. But sometimes, if I happen to have somebody else speak, people think, "Oh, Pastor got a day off." I tell you what, it's a lot more nerve wracking to sit there and listen to somebody preach, especially if I don't know them that well, uh, than to be up here doing it myself. Because you're always like, "What are they going to say? You know, what if they go a different direction that's not correct?" not biblical and 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 so um you know and, and sometimes i you know they get going in the direction like oh man and then but you know fortunately usually they turn it back around they don't go that far well in this case he went that far and you know he started uh, basically saying that if you die without confessing all your sins i'm going to talk about for salvation i'm talking about just day to day you know you did some things you shouldn't do and you die you're going to hell you're not going to heaven so, after this, you know, sometimes you have a special speaker. It takes three weeks to, you know, straighten it out. But you want to make sure you got everybody that heard that. Because, I mean, I don't want to, I had before stopped somebody, but 
but you know, stop the meeting. But uh, you know, you don't want to embarrass somebody either, and you know, so you got to kind of come back behind them and try to clean it up and, and so forth. And usually, the people, you know, if you're listening, you're you're going, no, that ain't that ain't right, you know. Anyway, but anyway, I went to the former pastor of this church that I was pastoring, and I began to tell him you know, what this guy said, thinking he's going to, oh man, Tony, I'm sorry, you know. And so I was telling this former pastor about it. You know, you know, he thinks that if you if you die before you confess the sin, then you're going to hell. He goes, Yeah. I said, You mean to tell me that we're sitting here having this conversation and I get angry at you, unjustified, I just get angry at you, and I stomp off and I go out the street and get hit by a truck, and you know, I love the Lord, I'm serving the Lord, and, and I die, I'm gonna go to hell? Yes. I thought, man, where's grace? You know, so that's the that's the one school of thought. Uh, uh, I, I remember sure I was briefly with a certain denomination many many years ago, and they had a song leader at this conference, and you could tell this song leader loved Jesus. I mean, he just bubbled with the love of Jesus. And then a little bit later on, he goes, "I just hope I make it. I just hope I make it." I tell you, church. That's no kind of a Christian life, just hoping you make it to heaven. They used to call it, I'm riding the altar to heaven. In other words, you know, basically you've got to come and get saved every week. And there's a lot of you grew up, maybe grew up in a church like that. I know Cheryl did. You know, I mean, they just pray they die before, you know, the next day so that they wouldn't sin and go to hell. And uh, but then you have those who believe. When you're saved, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And by that they mean since your sin is already forgiven, there's no need to ask for forgiveness. God never wants you to ask for forgiveness. God never wants you to confess anything because He's already taken care of it. And they believe that God cannot even see you or your sin when you sin. In other words, if I go out here and have an affair with someone, that, that God doesn't even see it. That, that God doesn't want me to confess that. Or ask forgiveness for that. Then there is the third school of thought of which I'm a member. That God does indeed forgive us of all of our sins, past, present, future, or sin, I should say, concerning our salvation, however not concerning our fellowship. God has actually forgiven everyone's sin. Now listen, God has forgiven everyone's sin. S-I-N, singular. The Adamic sin. The sin uh, that we were born into. He's forgiven. Matter of fact, it says in uh, uh, 1 John, I believe it's 2 2, he says, and Jesus, he is a propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He paid the price for all of our sin. However, in order for us to benefit from it, we have to receive His forgiveness by receiving Jesus. It's already been forgiven, but we have to apply it to our lives through accepting Jesus. And in like manner, we are forgiven for our sins. That is, the sins that we commit. We are forgiven for those sins, but that forgiveness is applied through confession. That's how you apply. Yes, He's forgiven you for it, but you apply that forgiveness through confessing that sin to Jesus. Now, let me just kind of give you an example. You know, I forgive my kids unconditionally. I mean, it doesn't matter what they do. It will not affect that I'm their dad. And I love them. Amen? Any parents can say amen to that? Amen. Now, that does not mean that I do not expect them to say I'm sorry if they sin against me. If they do something that hurts me. It doesn't mean I don't expect them to say I'm sorry for it. Even though in my mind they're forgiven, but it doesn't mean I don't want them to confess that to me and to say that I'm sorry. You see, if they were to do something like that and then they come and confess, that 
frees up our fellowship. It clears the air. And it's no different with God. God's forgiven us, yes, but we're still expected to come and confess that we can clear the air for that fellowship with Him. Look, if you would, to 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Listen to what it says. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Then I want you to look over to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. I'm going to begin in verse 1. It reads there, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, and it says he laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now here's the part I want you to see. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, I like the Simon Peter is an all or nothing kind of a guy. Amen. You're not going to wash my feet. But then he goes on to say, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, just give me a whole bath. So he went from don't touch my feet to give me a whole bath. Then Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. Now he's talking about two things here. One is, of course, of He's talking about Judas. But another thing he's talking about is, is the body. He said you're clean, but not all clean. Uh, he's basically telling Peter that he doesn't need to wash his head. He doesn't need to wash his body, just his feet. Now, if you are aware of how things went that day, you didn't have concrete sidewalks. You had dusty, dirty, muddy roads. So, you know, you could be going to something special, take a bath, and you're all clean, and you head out there, by the time you get there, you're still clean, except your feet are really dirty. And so he's saying, I just need to wash your feet. And you see, that is the way it is concerning our sin. We've been forgiven. We don't have to get saved all over again. But through the, our daily walk, we do some things and say some things, and there's some things that we need to confess. And it says He washes us when we do that. He's not washing us completely again like we're getting saved all over again. We're already saved. We're forgiven for that. But our feet need to be clean from time to time. And when you go to Him, you know, the Bible does say confession is good for the soul. Amen? At least it implies it. Amen? That when we confess to God, we can walk away refreshed, restore our fellowship with Him through that. Now, the New Testament is full of scriptures that deal with repentance, asking forgiveness, confessing sin. So I do not see how you can get around these scriptures. And I've studied and I've read the books and, 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 and some of the, the teachers that teach these things, I agree with a lot of what they say about grace. And it's wonderful. And yes, we do need a revelation of God's grace. But we've got to be careful not to take it to the point that we are ignoring Scripture. Amen? And I'm just going to take time to read some of these very quickly. There's so many more. But let me just read a few of them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 21. And it reads there, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they had practiced. Now he's, he's speaking to the Corinthian church. He's speaking to Christians. 
And he does say here uh, that they have not repented. They have not repented. So again, we need to repent. We, and again, that means to there is a sorrow connected to it and a turning away from that sin. So we need to be sorry for some of the things we did and we need to turn from some of our sins. James 5, 14 through 16. And it reads there, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another. You may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Again, there's this forgiveness. There's this confession going on. Hebrews 12, beginning with verse 1. And it reads there, Therefore also, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, listen, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the often finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against him, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted. Now, why would we have to resist if we're not concerned about sin? And it goes on, and earlier it said to lay aside the sin. So if God doesn't see the sin. Why would we resist the sin? Then, I, I, well, that's just a few. Now, here's my concern. Many times, and in and, and church I've seen this, when we get a mindset that this is the way it is, we either ignore Scripture or we start saying that Scripture is not that important. And I've seen godly men. I've seen those that, that uh, once said Scripture is the final authority start saying it's a guide and not an authority. So we've got to be careful to understand that Scripture is giving, given as the authority in our lives. Amen? And, and it doesn't matter what I believe. What matters is what saith the Word of God. That's our final authority. Amen. doesn't matter how good it sounds. What matters is what does the Scripture say? You know, it tells us that the Bereans search the Scriptures daily to see if these things be so. And you have to look at it in its complete text and context. Amen? So, the good news is God loves us and God has forgiven us and He does give us do-overs. Amen? Jesus taught and lived forgiveness. We're also told to forgive one another. We're told to give one another do-overs. I mentioned earlier there are some things that we should forgive and forget. And we would be expected to because in the grand scheme of things, uh, it would seem petty not to. You know, somebody hurts your feelings. And you just hold on to that for months and years. In the grand scheme of things, that's pretty petty, amen? It doesn't seem petty at the time. When you start comparing it with what God has forgiven us for and the price He paid to forgive us, to hang on to that because our feelings are hurt, is, it, in the grand scheme of things, is, is pretty petty. However, there are other things that might seem impossible to forgive. But we should forgive nonetheless because Scripture tells us we must. Because once we forgive the offender, resentment will begin to leave us. Forgiveness is an attitude of the heart. Forgiveness is a choice that we make. Forgiveness is not a pardon. You know, when I forgive somebody, that's not saying that there aren't still consequences for what they did. Forgiveness does not mean that we become a doormat, that you can just do whatever you want to do for me and I'll forgive you. The Bible does not tell us that we're to be doormats for people to walk on. It doesn't mean you have to continue in a relationship with somebody. 
Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a friend that betrays you over and over. Finally, you say, you know, I had enough. I do not want to be in this relationship anymore. And this person says, well, you have to be in this relationship because you have to forgive me. And, you, and you're, you're not doing what God says to do if you don't continue this relationship with me. That is not true. You have to forgive them, but that does not mean you have to stay in a relationship that is harmful to you. In other words, you're not holding that against them anymore, but you're just not going to be a doormat for them to just stomp on every time they want to stomp on you. <clears throat> forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. You can forgive somebody and still not trust them. You see, they should not have to earn your forgiveness. Well, I'll forgive them when they show me they're you know, worthy of me forgiving them. No, you forgive them and you offer it freely, but trust, on the other hand, must be earned. They have to earn that trust back in their lives. Forgiveness does not always mean that there won't be consequences. If somebody, uh, God forbid, would murder your child, or a drunken driver, you know, uh, uh, hits a car and kills your, your your child, you can forgive them, but that doesn't mean justice has been served. They still have consequences for their actions, but you're just saying. I am not going to hold it against you. If your spouse was unfaithful, abusive, and they say, I'm sorry, and you forgive them, that does not mean you're obligated to trust them automatically. I mean, you know, people can just use that all the time. Well, I said, I'm sorry. You said you forgave me, so you know, why are you acting that way? You violated a trust. And it would take some time to develop that trust once again in that relationship. You can forgive them and still not have total trust. Now hopefully over time, that trust would come back. Amen? And you know, I mean, I'm not saying you need to hang it over their head if that were to happen. But yet, at the same time, you're not expected to just automatically trust them just because you forgave them. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Because you're not called to put yourself at risk. Now what you can't do is you can't stay bitter and angry and speak evil of them because you forgave them. Amen? In Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 30, it reads, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking put away from you with all malice. When we hold on to unforgiveness, it will manifest in a root of bitterness. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and when we hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness and wrath, it grieves Him. You know you can still grieve the Holy Spirit? Bitterness will hurt you in so many ways. It can hurt your relationship with God. It takes away your sensitivity to the voice of God. It can reduce your effectiveness in ministry. You know, there used to be a saying, I guess there still is, you know, I just thank God for the unity that we have and, and, and so forth. But, you know, there's a lot of churches and there's a lot of pastors that, that you know, that get hurt and they continue ministry. And you can tell their ministry how to hurt. Because you can tell that, that unforgiveness is still in their heart. And, and it's almost like they lash out. Because all they, they look out and they see sheep with teeth. You know, they don't want to get bit again. It works the other way around too, where sheep look at the shepherd. You know, it works both ways. But that's what bitterness will do to you. It opens a door for the enemy. And we're told in Ephesians 4.27 not to give place to the devil. Amen. That's why we need to be quick to forgive. See, once you let it in, then you begin to spread to other areas of your life. And once he gains access, he, 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 has, he takes one room at a time. Amen. Until he's just clearing the whole house. Bitterness will affect your body as well. 
Science has proven that bitterness affects us mentally. Bitterness can cause stomach problems. It can cause heart problems. It can cause arthritis. It can cause depression. It can cause anxiety. All these things. Because of unforgiveness, which brings about bitterness. Again, bitterness is a choice. It's not an emotion. You choose to forgive. You make a choice to forgive. Your feelings may hang around for a while. You may say, well, I forgave them. I don't feel like I forgave them. You just got to keep reminding yourself. You made a choice to forgive them. Sometimes you got to make that choice over and over again. And then every time that feeling, that emotion rises up, you have to say, no, I forgave them. I think I told you once before to write it down on a piece of paper on such and such day. I chose to forgive so and so for doing whatever it may have been. And every time those feelings surface, you remind yourself, I forgave them. Amen? Forgiveness is a must. And forgiveness is more for you than it is for them. It sets you free. It takes you out of that prison of unforgiveness. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I just want to share a few things that I hope will help you as you seek to forgive someone who has wronged you. First of all, as you forgive, it doesn't mean you deny you've been hurt. That hurt is there. That hurt is real. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that hurt as you forgive. Realize you're making a decision to forgive. You decide that you're going to forgive somebody. You're saying, I'm giving up the right to seek revenge. I'm putting it into God's hands. Ask God to help you with the anger that is inside of you. Ask God to give you a forgiving heart. And realize that you also have hurt people. Ask God to forgive you and ask others to forgive you as well. Forgiveness. The Word of God tells us will set us free. I want you to take just a moment this morning. I ask you just ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Maybe there's some unforgiveness that's hiding somewhere in you. You thought you dealt with it, but you never really truly forgiven. Take this opportunity to just say, I release them. I forgive them. Or maybe you've already forgiven them, but it just keeps coming back up. Just remind yourself that you have forgiven them. Thank God for the freedom. Thank Him for forgiving you. Giving you a brand new start. Father, I lift up this church family. And Lord, I know that Every day is an opportunity to be hurt by somebody. And Lord, we understand that we're hurt the most by those that we're closest to. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to forgive and let go. And Father, I just thank you for the freedom that comes from that. And Lord, we just thank you again for your mercy that's new every morning for us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and nothing can separate us from your love. And we're just careful to give you the praise and the glory for all that you've done for us and what you're doing for us. And Lord, what you will do for us. Mm -hmm. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. Hallelujah.